Um, so I'm Sarah Elliott. I'm from Bournemouth University. Um, currently here doing a three-year postdoctoral fellowship. Um, but today I am going to be uh, talking about some of my um, PhD research. So this was um, conducted at the University of Reading. Um, and I'm going to be talking about the, the first farmers in the Middle East. So I'm just going to turn my video off while I talk. Um, so the first farmers in the Middle East is, is the topic today. And um, this is a uh, topic that um, is very, uh, very well researched um, across the world. And um, particularly today, I'm going to be focusing on um, the Middle East and this transition in the Middle East. So this is the transition from when people were hunters and gatherers and foragers living um, uh, very mobile, moving around the landscape, uh, living in small um, encampments and huts, but not really uh, permanently occupying an area in the landscape. And they're collecting their plants and they're hunting, hunting their animals. And then there's this transition um, to when they become uh, sedentary farmers. So this is when they're starting to live in small houses and villages um, and they're actually d managing and then eventually domesticating um, their plants and animals. So I just want to start off by looking more broadly about farming around the world to try and put the, the things I'm going to be talking about today um, in a little bit of context. So this uh, map here shows um, in red the multiple regions and centres of domestication for the different plants and animals um, across the world. Um, and these can broadly be split into the um, old world farming in the east and new world farming in, in the west. And one of the main differences between uh, these, this main uh, divide is the types of domesticates, so the types of plants and animals um, that were brought under domestication and brought under farming in these areas of the world. So in the New World farming, you're looking at things like um, squash and potatoes and maize, um, manioc and other, other crops. Um, and there's very few and much smaller animals that are actually domesticated in the New World. So you have things like the guinea pig, um, the alpaca and the llama. So these are very different to the domesticates that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, over in the East, um, uh, in the Middle East and parts of Asia and Africa, you have a, a very different range of domesticates, so a different range of animals that were um, eventually farmed and a different range of crops as well. So for the crops, you've got things like wheat and barley, um, rice and millet. And then for the animals, you're looking at um, sheep and goat, um, cattle and pig. So very different between the old world and the new world farming. And then when it comes to looking at uh, when these centres of domestication started and developed, um, there's, there's very largely different dates for different areas as well. So um, here's some of the um, earliest domestication. So today I'm talking about the Middle East. This is 12 to 10,000 years ago, although you do have some uh, early domestication in the Americas, particularly of um, maize and squash there. But then through time, uh, you get these other centres of domestication developing around the world. So different domesticates at different times times um, across the world. So today I'm focusing on um, the first farmers, the earliest farmers. So this is um, the Middle East and as I said from about 12 to 10,000 years ago. So it's not the whole of the Middle East when we talk about the first farmers. It's this area that's specifically referred to uh, as the Fertile Crescent. So it's a crescent shape or sort of a boomerang shape that goes from southern Jordan uh, up through Palestine, Israel, Syria, clipping Turkey, and then going back down to, through the Zagros Mountains of Iraq and Iran. So this is broadly the area that I'm going to be um, discussing today. So even within this uh, area, this uh, center of domestication, um, the earliest, the first farmers, there still is variation within this area. So this um, image shows where different plants and, and animals were first um, show evidence for domestication or management. So you can see here that on the on the left down through uh, Jordan, Palestine and Israel, you've got the extent of uh, wheat and barley domesticated up to 12,000 years ago. But when looking at some of the animals, you can see up in the north and then down over to the east. Um, goats, goats were first domesticated in the east, about 11,000, um, and sheep in the north, also around 11,000. So even within the Middle East itself, there's um, very, very different centres of domestication, so different pockets of domestication within this fertile crescent. So I wanted to look a little bit about these people um, in 
uh, in at this uh, transitional period from from this hunting and gathering to farming. So in the Middle East, the first farmers um, were established and developed in a period um, referred to as the Neolithic, or literally the the New Stone Age. And this is, dates from about twelve thousand to seven thousand years ago in its in its full extent. So this is a period where they're starting to um, manage their their plants and their animals and start starting to live more permanently within the landscape. So on the right here, I've uh, put some images of some reconstructions of some of the Neolithic houses. These ones are particularly from Jordan. So you've got some drawings of some reconstructions and some physical reconstructions which have been built um, in various places across Jordan. So in, in Jordan, the, the first villages, the first houses are circular dwellings made of mud and stone. Um, over in the east, in Iraq and Iran, you do get more rectilinear architecture. So it is, again, variable across the region. This is a period where you start to see, see things like storage of, um, of, of crops. So the bottom right hand image there shows a reconstruction of a site in Jordan where they were storing um, cereal grains, so surplus storage of, of food here. And um, then uh, this is also a period where you get a lot of things like human um, burials. Um, these burials are often un underneath the, uh, the, the house, house, underneath the floors of the dwellings. Um, and this is a period where we're also seeing uh, development of things like um, jewellery and adornment, so made from uh, stone beads. There's some images there of various stone beads found at the, some of these Neolithic sites, and a lot more art and ritual um, and figurines and stuff going on in this period. So this picture on the left here is a reconstruction of what the environment may have have uh, looked like in the in the Neolithic period. This is a re this is from the front of Steve Mythen and Bill Finlayson's book for, of uh, the archaeology in an area called Wadi Finan in Jordan. So as you can see here, it's a very um, lush landscape. You've got quite a lot of greenery, and you've got um, water running through through this wadi system. And in comparison to what it looks like today, so this is a photograph of this same reconstructed wadi, um, and here you can see it's very dry and very arid. But in the Neolithic, it would have been um, a lot more suitable for the domestication of plants and animals. So looking at the full range of the plants and animals that were um, domesticated and managed by the first farmers in, in the Middle East, for the plants, you've got different types of wheat and barley, and then you've got the legumes such as lentil and chickpea. For the animals, particularly important are the sheep, goat, uh, pig and cattle. So when these are all eventually domesticated, eventually come together in the farming com communities, it's referred to as the Neolithic package. But as I said, within the, the Middle East, within this Fertile Crescent, it all didn't happen at the same time. In the past, it was thought that this whole, um, what was, is referred to as the Neolithic Re Revolution, occurred over a few hundreds of years. But actually, as research has um, increased and methods have increased as well, um, we've, we see that actually this, um, this shift from hunting and gathering to farming actually happened over a much longer period of time, so sort of two to three thousand years rather than two to three hundred years. And so it's not until the later um, later Neolithic period that you actually get this whole package of domesticates together in the Middle East. So um, looking um, particularly today, we're going to look at the first herders in the Neolithic, so the first herders um, in the Fertile Crescent. So um, this is going to be part of my PhD research that I'm showing, and I was particularly focused on, on the animal side of things. So um, in the eastern northern Fertile Crescent, um, evidence from archaeological animal bones have shown that there's uh, herding and domestication from about 11,000 years ago. And this is 500 to 1,000 years earlier than what's happening in the Western Fertile Crescent, so in Jordan, Palestine, Israel. So um, the, uh, this is the earliest herding, but not necessarily the area of the um, earliest crop domestication. And the evidence comes um, mainly from, as I said, animal bones and it's it's when they find a lot of young males which are being slaughtered for their meat and the a lack of older females uh, in the bone assemblages which are used they're kept in in the communities for for breeding um, and milk and that sort of thing so looking a little bit about why um, people became farmers so why they decided they and did this transition to domesticated animals for and domesticated crops um, so there's many different theories and um, often 
debated, very much debated and not always necessarily agreed upon. But one of the um, suggestions for the reason behind uh, the initial farming and becoming farmers is that of population pressure. So this um, was a uh, competition for food with increasing populations. So they were solving subsistence problems. So the bigger the population, the more food. So the more food that they need to either obtain or, or produce. Other theories of why they became farmers are more based on ideas about nutrition, such as um, including things like milk in the diet. So when the animals are domesticated, you can then um, get other products from them in addition to just the meat or the hide, for example, when they're slaughtered. So milk is one um, secondary product, um, looking at the nutrition side, but there's other secondary products which, are, which was, have been seen as drivers for domestication as well. For example, um, animal dung. So animal dung in the Middle East is uh, often used as a fuel, and there's a lot of sites where we can see um, animal dung being burnt, uh, especially in areas where you don't have as many trees, so there's not as much wood, wood fuel available. This was a period, um, the Neolithic was a period at the end of the Pleistocene and beginning of the Holocene where climate was becoming warmer and wetter. So it's perhaps a more better time to be able to settle down and, and live in one particular area rather than cons consistently moving around the landscape. Um, and another reason that might sort of be a driver for, for domestication, a driver for becoming farmers, is that human behaviour is constantly evolving in the past and today. So um, perhaps they were going under a, a lot of constant experimentation. Maybe they were trying this um, domestication farming process, um, trial and error, and maybe um, some places it worked and some places it didn't. So specifically today, I'm going to talk um, about the earliest uh, evidence for for the domestication of, of animals. And this is in uh, the Zagros Mountains of Iraq and Iran. So this, this area um, in the Zagros Mountains and up, up into the northern, northern Fertile Crescent was an area where all four of the major livestock species came under management uh, from 11 to 10,000 years ago. But this didn't happen in the, um, in the other end of the Fertile Crescent in Jordan, Israel and Palestine. So um, it, it was occurring in the Zagros Mountains first, and this is um, what I'm going to show you some some, da some data and some of my research for today. So the Zagros Mountains had a very very diverse area for resources. It was topographically very diverse, with very high mountains and very low flat um, plains. Um, and this was an area where you get uh, wild sheep and wild goat um, living in very large numbers. So in this area of the Fertile Crescent, we had the wild um, populations that were which were brought under domestication. But the other end of the Fertile Crescent, although there are some sheep and goat there, some wild sheep and goat, it's very much dominated by gazelle and other types of animals such as ibex. So um, the reason for the Zagros being the earliest area is down to the animals who were already living in this environment and that were very suitable for domestication. So on this other end of the Fertile Crescent in, in Jordan, the areas around Jordan, it wasn't really suitable for them uh, for first domestication because of the dominance of gazelle in this area. So the gazelle um, are, are very behaviourally unsuitable to domestication. Um, the, male, the males within the gazelle herds are highly territorial, so they can't be often kept together in, in massive herds. Um, they're very nervous around humans and they would not have they do not have the behavioral traits which would have would have been uh, uh, successful for herding and penning and eventually um, uh, breeding breeding them for domesticates so many scholars and academics have argued that there's some evidence for gazelle population management in the form of selective hunting but there's no um, evidence uh, to date that this um, this species was ever domesticated so in the Zagros um, it's it occurred earlier because of these wild sheep and goat that were there in huge numbers um, around the environment so I wanted to uh, talk a little bit about how we actually detect this early farming, this early herding of animals. So one of uh, the things which is analysed by uh, archaeozoologists, so this is people that study the animal bones from archaeological sites, they look at the size um, and shape of the bones. And so on the right here, I've got images um, of both wild and domesticated versions of uh, goat, cattle and 
and pig. Um, so eventually there is a reduction in overall body size of the animal um, and the horn cores. So the horns, for, uh, inner bits of the horns, they change in si size and shape um, over time. So these um, evidence of change in size and shape are, do result from human interference, but they don't actually show these earliest um, earliest um, periods of domestication. So these these changes don't actually occur till about 9,500 to 9,000 years ago. So it's actually uh, a later a later um, response to domestication. So and it's actually been proven now from research to result from people actually moving the animals into a different habitat, which is more hotter and drier. So archaeozoologists do look at the, the size of the bones. A lot of um, horns, for example, are found on a lot of Neolithic sites, and they look um, at the size and shape to, to try and see the different um, indications of, of domestication. So in the centre here, I've got a picture on the left um, of a wild goat and a picture on the right of, of a domesticated goat. And, you, and there's a change in size and shape of their horns. So um, this is, although this does show a domesticated herd, it will not show us the um, earliest uh, indications of farming. So now it's common that the research uh, done by the archaeozoologists looking at the animal bones is that they're looking at the um, sex and age of the bones. They're looking at the herd structure. They're distinguishing between um, bones that originate from male and female animals. Um, and so they're looking specifically at what's referred to as the harvest profiles. So they're looking at differences in culling practices between hunting um, human populations and herding human populations. So um, the skeletal remains themselves can be studied and the elements can be distinguished between male, female and age as well. And what they find in a archaeological site where they are hunting is you get a lot of large adult adult males and this is so that they can maximize their return so that when they're out hunting they'll pick the biggest um, animal to, to target and kill, bring back so they've got more meat for the people um, the people to eat but when you transition into a herding society when the, when they're starting to manage and domesticate the animals what you see in the animal bones is an excess of young male bones so the young males are being slaughtered um, and also the older females are being slaughtered as well so they're really only keeping the um, female goats alive that can reproduce and produce milk um, and some of the males um, for herd propagation so you see a very much a difference in the the herd structure or the uh, the herd profile. So this is how um, archaeozoologists are now predominantly are looking at the animal bones to so try and identify these signs of early management and domestication. So the archaeozoologists take the bones that they recover from the archaeological sites and they do multiple different um, measurements on all of the bones um, to, to identify the age and, and the sex of the bone to be able to look at the overall um, profile of the herd um, through and looking at it also through time. But if um, the, the bones from the archaeological site are poorly preserved and not preserved at all, then this um, creates problems in trying to identify accurately the herding profile. So these pictures in the middle, for example, show some bones which are poorly preserved and you can see the outline uh, drawn in there where the bone would have extended to. So in, in the case where the bones aren't well preserved, you can't get full and accurate measurements um, of all of the types of the bones to reconstruct the herd profile. And on the right here, there's um, some fragments of poorly preserved bones which can't be identified at all. So sometimes um, you don't necessarily have the material available to do the, the analysis um, on, the, on the animal bones. So these pictures also show um, some of the animal bones from one of the sites I'm going to talk about later. So this is a site in Iraqi Kurdistan. These three pictures at the top show uh, animal bones in situ. So this is in the sediments before they've actually been excavated. They've been revealed but not removed from the, from the sediment yet. And as you can see, they're very fractured and broken. So um, once this bone is out of the sediment, uh, it, the measurements aren't going to be very accurate and they perhaps cannot um, attribute it to, uh, to sex or age. So it becomes problematic um, if you don't have well-preserved bones. And this site of the, where these bones come from in particular um, was very bad for the preservation of bones because the water table was very high. And when the water table is high and it fluctuates, the bones become wet and dry and wet and dry. And this isn't very good for preservation. So you can have many problems with trying to identify um, uh, evidence of herding and farming um, from the archaeozoological remains. 
So this um, brings me into the research that I did as um, part of my PhD. And this was particularly trying to target other methods um, to try and detect early farming, domestication and herding. Um, so this was looking at microscopic signatures to try and identify animal dung. So before I go on to explain how we can use that animal dung to identify farming, I just wanted to explain a little bit about how we actually identify the dung within the, within the archaeological deposits. So the thing that I look for um, in the sediments that I recover from the archaeological sites, they're referred to as fecal spherulites. So they're very, very small um, calcium carbonate particles. They're 5 to 15 microns in size. Um, so you have to use a high-powered microscope to, to identify these. These are form in the gut of animals during digestion and uh, pass through the digestive system and end up in the dung. Um, when you look at them under high powered microscope in cross polarized light, you can see this very, very distinctive cross, what's referred to as a cross of extinction. So it looks like a little, um, little hot cross bun and I've circled a load of them on the right hand picture there. So these are very uh, well preserved in many archaeological deposits and for tens of thousands of years. So the oldest fecal spherulites I've ever identified uh, date to about 28,000 years ago. Um, so they're very, can be very well preserved over long periods of time. So how can identifying dung and archaeological deposits actually help when it comes to looking for animal uh, domestication, animal management and evidence of farming? So at this period where they're starting to manage the herds and uh, selectively breed them and eventually developing into fully fledged domestication, in order to start this process, they would have had to corral them. They would have had to put them in a pen to keep them in a location to start this um, management and domestication process. So um, if I can identify these animal pens in the ancient sediments, then it would be an indication, indication of management or domestication. So these, um, it's not only identifying the, the fecal spherulites which are produced um, in the gut of the animal and well preserved in the dung, it's specifically to try and identify these uh, penning deposits. And the way to identify these penning deposits is to look at the sediments themselves and to look at the morph morphology of the of the dung remains. So when the animals are in, their, in the pen because they're constrained to a certain area they're trampling down the dung as they're um, as they're producing it so they've got a lot of um, weight on top of the dung and it becomes compacted um, and laminated and you get a certain uh, type of structure within penning deposits which can be identified microscopically. So um, as part of my PhD um, in Iraqi Kurdistan and currently during my current postdoc, I spend a lot of time uh, collecting dung samples and looking at animal dung. Um, I, I look at a lot of modern samples in order to make comparisons um, and identify archaeologically. Um, and I'm particularly also interested in animal diets. I spend a lot of time observing herds and looking at what they're eating, where they're grazing, where they're browsing. Uh, that picture on the top right is me and my colleague Jade Whitlam in Iraqi Kurdistan uh, observing a herd and, and taking samples. We're out there with uh, the herder that you can see in the left of the photo is actually having, having a nap um, while he's herding. Um, so I spend a lot of time taking a lot of different dung samples in order to look at them under the microscope to help facilitate um, archaeological identification. So all of these samples are processed and put under the under the high powered mi microscope and I look at the presence and number of these little fecal spherulites that are produced and looking at microscopic plant remains as well. But I'm, I'm not going to go into the, uh, the diet and the plant remains today. Um, but I look at various different um, aspects of the dung under the microscope. I also sample a lot of modern animal pens so I can see this um, compaction and lamination under the microscope to look at these specific microstructures, um, to look at the, the shape and orientation of the voids to try and um, ident again help me identify these ancient animal pens. So the, the dung samples um, can broadly be grouped into um, different types. So herbivore dung, for example, this is all of your cow, sheep, goat. Um, under the microscope, it looks very brown. Um, you get a lot of grasses and cereals. So it's obviously what they're, what they're eating is also coming out in the dung. You see a lot of these fecal spherulites. So herbivores are really high producers of fecal spherulites. You see um, hundreds of thousands of millions of them per per um, per dung pellet. So um, very, very distinctive uh, under the microscope. 
and this is in comparison to the omnivore dung. So this is your pig, um, your wild boar, and humans also fit into this category. So under the microscope, the um, omnivore dung looks um, very different. It's mainly it's a very orangey in colour rather than brown. You do get these fecal spherulites, but they're very low in numbers. So you see sporadic individual ones rather than groups or multiple multiple ones um, in these types of dung. Um, you see a lot less of the plant remains because the omnivores have a much varied diet. So you see you definitely see differences between um, uh, both the fecal spherulites, the colour and the diet of the animal. So having identified different types of dung and dung structures um, in modern samples. <clears throat> I wanted to explain a little bit how I, about how I go about looking for this in archaeological sites. So the technique I use um, is called micromorphology. So literally looking at the <clears throat> microscopic um, morphology of the sediments. So I take these blocks of soil as a picture of me taking a sample there in Iraqi Kurdistan. So I cut out this block of soil from the archaeological site, take it back to the lab. And when I'm in the lab, I impregnate it with resin and cut it and grind it and mount it onto a glass uh, microscope slide. And then it can be put under the microscope and you can look for these microscopic features. So when, when you look at um, under the microscope at high, high power, you can identify these small 5 to 15 micron fecal spherulites in associated, say, association with plant material and this uh, compacted and laminated structure as well. So even over 10,000 years, you can still identify these, um, these different features to identify potential penning deposits. There's various other methods I do use while on the archaeological sites to try and narrow down where I'm going to take a sample. Um, I'm not going to go into all of them because uh, I don't have time, but I just wanted to mention um, portable X-ray fluorescence. So obviously, when you're excavating an archaeological site, you may have multiple trenches or a large trench. So um, taking these sample micromorphological samples can be quite time consuming. So I use this method to try and target areas where there might be dung. So particularly, uh, I use this analyzer, which um, is the PXRF analyzes uh, 30 geochemical elements, but I'm particularly interested in phosphorus. So dung and bones and food residues and ashes from hearths, they all um, produce a um, very high phosphorus levels. So although dung itself isn't the only, only thing that could um, produce phosphorus, when you find high phosphorus levels, it, it might indicate um, that there might be some dung there. So this is how I try and uh, narrow down the areas that I might um, go, go and take these additional micromorphological samples. So the graph on the right, for example, I've just highlighted the two elevated readings there, and that's a location that I went back and sampled um, and found animal dung there. So I'm going to um, present the data just from two of the case studies that I looked at for my for my PhD, um, just to show you some of the evidence for animal penning. So this is the Central Zagros Archaeological Project, um, and this was at the university uh, project run by the University of Reading uh, by Wendy and Roger Matthews. Um, so this is in the Mount the Zagros Mountains in both Iraq and Iran. So we had two sites um, in Iraqi Kurdistan and two sites in Iran. Um, and I'm going to talk about uh, one site um, in Iran and one site in Iraqi Kurdistan. So this is the site of Sheikh Abad in Iran. So this site is in the upper Zagros Mountains. It's about 1400 metres above sea level. It's what's referred to as a, a tell site, which is essentially a, a mound of archaeological material. So this site was about 8 to 10 metres in height and dates from 11,800 to 9,600 years ago. So this site is a uh, very lots of remains on it. It's very typical for the Neolithic. You have bones worked into um, personal adornment. You have these animal skulls, various tokens, burials, everything is very typical um, of the Neolithic. So this um, shows a plan of the uh, the topmost trench at the site. So that we excavated here in various um, buildings and structures were found. On the left there, there's a, a structure which has um, five uh, sheep and goat skulls arranged at one end of it, so some sort of ritual deposit there in that T-shaped building. The area I want to show you some results from is over on the right-hand side uh, here in space eight. So this space of uh, this part of the trench is only about two meters by two meters, um, and the yellow dashed line shows where this uh, the location of this picture. So 
this is the area that was sampled for the micromorphological samples. So it's the deposits um, within the space, so look at, looking into, into the building. So during excavation, this area, you can just see these striations here in, in the deposits. So during excavation, they were actually interpreted as probable um, floor layers, so plastered, multiple plastered floor layers. Um, but these were then uh, sampled for, for these micromorphological blocks, cut, cut into the deposits and taken back uh, to the lab. So instead of being floor deposits within this two by two, meter structure is actually an area that was being used repetitively uh, as an animal pen, particularly for penning of sheep and goats, of, of the herbivores. So this uh, sample in the in the middle there, it's not that clear. You can see um, the, the horiz repetitive horizontal layers of dung. I've marked them out with um, red arrows um, because they're not 100% clear um, by, by eye, but they're very clear under the microscope. So these are repetitive layers of brown laminated compacted dung with very, very high numbers of fecal spherulites. So this was um, an area that was in, that then interpreted as an area where animals were kept, um, not permanently, but periodically they were brought in and kept in this area. So the evidence um, from the micromorphology samples um, at this size, Sheikh Abad in Iran, therefore is identified uh, management and domestication from, from the animal dung, um, identified microscopically um, without even um, using the evidence from the animal bones. Of course, we always inter in integrate um, all of the evidence together, but this um, is another line of evidence which has confirmed and identified um, sheep and goat uh, farming management domestication um, under the microscope. So moving on to the uh, other example I'm going to show you, this is a site uh, over the border in, in Iraqi Kurdistan, um, and this is the site of Bestan Sur. So it's a slightly later dating from 9,700 to 9,100 years ago. It's um, much lower in the Zagros uh, foothills. It's only about 500 metres above sea level. It's a much smaller mound, uh, only 7.5 metres high. Um, um, but what I should say about this mound is that the uh, upper layers actually aren't dated to the Neolithic. They're uh, much later in the Iron Age. So people came back to the site and reoccupied it, reoccupied it in a later period. Unfortunately, we couldn't get anyone to excavate off all that later archaeology. So most of our excavations were conducted around the base of the mound and in the fields surrounding the mound. So the occupation, the Neolithic occupation, did spread out further than beyond the mound itself. But again, very typical finds uh, found at this site, um, burials, um, lots of obsidian stone tools. This is volcanic glass. Glass, um, personal adornment in the form of pierced um, pierced shells, and um, this excavation, uh, as I said, it was mainly the the trenches all around the edge of, edge of the mound. So here you can see the location of various trenches um, around the edge, or actually cut into the edge of the edge edge of the mound as well. So trench ten there in the on the right hand side in the east was the area where they found multiple um, burials. So under one house floor, there was something like 10, 10 human burials under there. Uh, but the trench that I'm going to look at is um, the trench of the far north, trench 12 and 13. So this was an area where we cut um, a large section into the edge of the Neolithic deposits. Um, and during excavation, you can see in the left hand photo here, lots of different um, layers were appearing. So I PXRF'd all of these layers looking for elevated areas of, uh, of phosphorus. And then I took my samples where, where the highest, um, highest levels of phosphorus were through, through some of these um, different layers. So when these samples were taken back to the lab and put under the microscope, um, what I found was lots of repetitive layers of um, orange uh, fecal material. I'm going to refer to it as fecal material, not dung for the moment, and I'll explain why, why shortly. Um, but these were compacted and orange layers. Um, they did have small fragments of bone in there, lower, lower levels of, um, of grasses, um, and single um, and sporadic fecal spherulite. So very much indicating omnivore fecal material and repetitive layers of it in this location of the trench. But um, I conducted further analyses on these deposits um, 
again another method I'm not going to go into in detail here it's a method called uh, GCMS um, so you can further test these deposits to try and distinguish a little bit more about the origin of the of the fecal material what happened with these samples is that a lot of them actually came back as human so or originated from human waste material and this most um, recent upper deposit was the only one that was identified as wild boar or pig so it seems this, this um, area of the uh, area of the trench is a general waste area or discard area but eventually it's an area where um, animal uh, wild boar or, or domesticated goat were being were eventually being kept so um, Again, uh, this site, it's uh, the identification of this penning, but it, for this case, eventually omnivores in the, in the later levels anyway, was identified um, under the microscope, so non-macroscopically non or microscopically. Um, and this site was the site where I showed you all of those poorly preserved bo bones um, earlier on in, in the presentation. So this site had very poor preservation of the animal bones. A lot of the bones, like this one on the left, came out completely fragmented. So it's very difficult to do all of those measurements to try and identify identify different um, herd profiles here. Um, so it was good to have the additional additional information from, from the animal dung. This site, there was a lot of other dung found, a lot of herbivore dung as well, but um, more being used as sec a secondary product in um, fires, for example. But again, I'm, I'm not going to go into, into that those results in detail. So just to conclude, I hope that I've shown you that there's um, consistently new types of evidence that are emerging and um, increasingly we can use a lots of different methods to try and look at the same questions that archaeologists have been asking for years these big questions about the big transition from hunting and gathering to, to farming and domestication so often these things that we actually can't see um, visually um, we can look at them under the microscope and with many different types of um, microscopic methodologies in order to identify some of these big um, big research questions. And just to, to finish on, um, a lot of people ask me why I research this topic and why I think it's important. So this early um, transition to, to farming domestication is what eventually led to villages and towns and big civilizations and to mass food production that we obviously um, have today. And I've added a few photos there about some really modern, modern types of farming using drones and other sorts of um, robotics in farming. So it's kind of the key, the key shift um, uh, in the process to, to, to where we are today. So there's a range of people I just wanted to thank that um, from the CSAP project and other parts of the field work um, that were involved uh, in, in the PhD research. So I believe uh, now we're going to have a break and then after the break I'm happy to uh, answer any questions that anyone may have.